Lots of people just mess around with distortion until it sounds good. And if that works for you, great. But there are some principles that once you understand will help you dial in your distortion much quicker. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to pick the right distortion or saturation for whatever situation you're in. In the last video, I showed you how you can shape the sound before and after distortion to get the tone you want, but I glossed over the actual distortion process. So let's go into depth about that. I recommend you watch the first two videos of this series because a lot of this stuff isn't gonna make sense unless you've seen them. In the last video, I focused on two kinds of curves, odd symmetric curves and asymmetric curves that have a similar shape. These are the most common kinds of curves used in distortion, and really the word saturation refers to curves like these. Specifically, this flattening in the top and bottom. Increasing X causes a smaller and smaller increase in Y. At a certain point, we can't add any more Y, so our system is completely saturated with Y. If the curve deviates from these general shapes, it's usually called wave shaping, but the principle is the same. We take each point in the wave and scale it to some value dictated by the curve. I'll talk about these weirder shapes another time, but right now I want to talk about why we keep coming back to these curves. What makes these shapes special? If you ask most audio professionals, why do we use these curves? They'll say something like, we've just become accustomed to this kind of distortion because it's familiar, since these curves emulate the soft clipping of analog gear. But I don't like that answer. If these curves made an ugly sounding distortion, they wouldn't be used, regardless of any nostalgia for the analog sound. I'm sure nostalgia plays a part in it, but if these curves didn't sound good, engineers back in the day would have been much more mindful of their gain staging, to reduce saturation. Yet this sound has been sought out since the 60s, and here we are paying our hard-earned money for plugins that can emulate this sound. These curves are called sigmoids, and they have some nice properties that make them useful to us. First off, these curves are monotonic, which means they never decrease. This is important because it means the relative order of all the different heights on a wave are preserved. For example, Distorting a wave into this curve causes the lowest point to still be the lowest point on the resulting wave, and the highest point to remain as the highest, and the relative order of all the points in between also stays the same. Monotonic curves preserve the general shape of a wave and don't add any new turning points, and this allows for smoother distortion. If we use a wave shaper with a non-monotonic shape, the order of all the relative heights on the wave changes, and it results in much harsher distortion. A perfect example of this is wave folding. There's another reason why these curves sound good. It's that they smoothly transition into clipping. There are other monotonic curves like this, but these curves don't smoothly transition into distortion. Sigmoids are relatively linear for low amplitudes so there's minimal distortion. As the level of the wave increases, the curve deviates more from a line, and so the distortion increases. With these other curves, low amplitudes can be non-linear, or there's no simple relationship between input and output. The smooth transition into clipping also ensures that the added harmonics have a nice downward sloping trend. Curves that are built using an exponential like this don't have an upper bound, and so in this abstract mathematical world, these curves will never clip. In the real world, however, we don't have infinite headroom, and so the smooth curve will be forced to clip abruptly if the level is too high. This shape also has the added bonus that it compresses a wave as its level increases. In the last video, I showed you how these curves reduce the level of low amplitude frequencies, and this is really just a consequence of the compression caused by these curves. You can see it from the curve too. When we use this shape, most of the curve goes above the midpoint, and so when a wave is driven into this saturator, more of the wave will be concentrated in this region, so it'll be compressed more. This idea of increasing the level of a wave leading to an increase in distortion and compression and eventually clipping are all really desirable characteristics that only these curves have. But in which situations should you choose symmetric and in which situations asymmetric? Knowing the differences in sound between these two curves and how they affect your mix is crucial. We'll start with asymmetric. Asymmetric curves tend to fill up the frequency spectrum more than symmetric curves, because while both these curves create odd harmonics, asymmetric curves tend to also create more even harmonics. Now, there are some exceptions to this, but most of the time, this is true. So I have this guitar loop here, and it's pretty clean. Take a listen. Mm -hmm. 
Now listen to what it sounds like when I start to distort it symmetrically. So you can hear it gets louder and more distorted and more compressed. But listen to what happens when I add some asymmetry into this curve. So right off the bat, you can hear the high end buzzing more. And if I draw your attention to the low end, the low end becomes a lot more beefy. As a whole, the guitar loop is a lot fuzzier. And this is literally what a lot of fuzz pedals do. The godfather of all fuzz pedals, the fuzz face, is just extreme asymmetric clipping. Here's another example. I have this drum loop that I'm gonna distort symmetrically and then slowly bring in the asymmetry over time. So you can hear how the low end is a lot warmer but it loses a lot of clarity and definition. And as I'll show you in a second, this is a direct result of filling up the frequency spectrum. This is probably the main decision you have to make when you distort something. How much of the frequency spectrum do I wanna fill up? Not only do asymmetric curves cause more even harmonics, they also lead to more intermodulation distortion. Remember from the first video in this series, Intermodulation distortion occurs when you distort a complex wave and the added frequencies aren't harmonically related to each other, which can sound harsh. If the sound you're distorting is complex, like a real instrument, you'll get intermodulation distortion and there's nothing you can do about it. Asymmetric curves shape the bottom and top of the wave in different ways, which cause the wave to become more complex, leading to more intermodulation distortion products resulting in a sound that fills up the frequency spectrum more. If a sound already has a complex frequency distribution that takes up a lot of space in the spectrum, driving it into a highly asymmetric curve means you won't be able to crank it as hard before it starts to sound bad. In this case, symmetric curves tend to work better because symmetric curves distort the top and bottom of the wave in the same way. And so you can get that increase in loudness and distortion and compression with less complexity added to the wave, meaning less frequencies will be added, which can allow you to push it harder before it starts to sound bad. And this isn't an issue of symmetric versus asymmetric, but rather how much asymmetry. This asymmetric curve will fill out the frequency spectrum more than this one, because this one is closer to the symmetric curve. Obviously, these aren't rules. In any creative endeavor, there are no rules, but rather guidelines that seem to work consistently. And there are exceptions to this. If you're interested, you can pause here and read this. So asymmetric curves usually fill up the frequency spectrum more, but this has different perceptible effects for low frequencies than it does with high frequencies. The newly added even harmonics that asymmetric curves make more of cause the low end to become more tonal. That's to say, your ear is more able to easily discern the note playing. That's because as we saw in the first video of this series, even harmonics are at less dissonant musical intervals, but also all of the harmonics that are octaves are even harmonics, which can cause a sort of effect where a sound opens up and asserts its pitch more clearly. So if I want a sound to have a more defined pitch, Asymmetric saturation can help with that, but this only really applies if a sound is tonal with a nice, well-defined harmonic series. But what if a sound is atonal, like cymbals? You don't play an E note on the cymbal. This is because the amplitude of the vibrations in the cymbal are about as large as the thickness of the cymbal, and this gives rise to a different nonlinearity called a geometric nonlinearity, which causes the sound to not have an obvious pitch. But when you saturate a sound like this, the symmetry you choose is still important. Asymmetric curves can make atonal sounds even more noisy and can add a lot of low end and oftentimes add a DC offset as well. Remember from a previous video, a DC offset is the zeroth harmonic. So asymmetric curves can cause a DC offset, which makes sense if you think about it. If a wave is centered at zero, an asymmetric curve shapes the bottom and top differently, making the average level different from zero, which is a DC offset. 
This is why lots of distortion plugins have a DC filter, but if yours doesn't, it's wise to put a high pass filter after. So that's the lows. Asymmetric saturation in the highs tends to make the highs smoother. Now, usually I hate using arbitrary words to describe audio, but hear me out. I think smooth is a good word here. There's this phenomenon in audio. When two tones get very close together, it's hard for our ears to hear them as two separate tones. Our ears don't have perfect resolution, and so the tones kind of blur together. In 1940, this guy named Harvey Fletcher had this idea. The way we perceive sound is like a bunch of little overlapping frequency bands. If two tones are in the same band, we'll have trouble telling them apart. For higher and higher frequencies, the bandwidths of these tiny filters increase. And this means it's harder for our ears to lock onto higher harmonics when there's other frequencies around. If there are two tones very close together, it's hard for us to differentiate them and they get kind of smeared out. By the way, this guy is the same Fletcher behind the Fletcher Munson curves that everybody likes to talk about. A 1989 study showed that adding a thin band of white noise around a specific frequency reduces the perceived loudness of that frequency. The study showed that if we have a tone and slowly fill in the space around it with noise, we have to increase the level of the tone for it to remain at the same volume up to a certain point, after which increasing the bandwidth of the noise doesn't change the perceived level. So one method to tame harsh high frequencies is to add noise around those frequencies. This is analogous to saturation. The higher harmonics of a sound can be made to sound smoother or noisier or more filled in because it fills in the spaces between harmonics simply due to the fact that there's more intermodulation distortion. I think this is also why a lot of electronic music that uses big bright synths also uses a lot of white noise in the high end. The noise fills in the spaces between the harmonics of the synths, which fills the mix out, but it also reduces the harshness of those high harmonics and allows for these bright in-your-face walls of sound. So asymmetric saturation tends to make the low end more tonal, smooths out the high end, and overall makes something take up more space in the frequency spectrum. But don't go thinking that these are necessarily good things for a sound. Sure, asymmetric saturation will make something have a larger footprint in the frequency spectrum, but this can cause the sound to lose definition in any one region of the spectrum. As I showed in my EQ video, cutting a frequency causes the frequencies on both sides to stand out more. But this concept also works in reverse, filling in the holes between frequencies leads to a loss in clarity and definition as these frequencies start to blur together. I have this sine wave, a single frequency, and listen to the tone. Now I'm going to distort it symmetrically. So you can still hear the original tone, but you can also hear the harmonics. Listen carefully, you can hear one of the higher harmonics. Really listen. Makes like kind of a major chord. But when I add even harmonics into this, that tone is still there, but it's a lot less noticeable because the density of harmonics is much higher, which means that each harmonic has less room to stand out. All kinds of saturation fills in these holes, but asymmetric saturation does it more than symmetric, so there'll be less room for other sounds in your mix. The symmetry of your saturation curve is really a trade-off of the tone you want and what the mix needs. More tonality and fullness isn't necessarily better. In fact, most of the time I would say it isn't. Symmetric saturation is more subtle and versatile simply because it adds less frequencies, leading to less clashing between sounds. So just to build up an ear for the differences in sound between symmetric and asymmetric, I'm going to distort some sounds. So I have this guitar. By the way, I know I keep using guitar examples, but distortion was really pioneered in the world of electric guitars. But these concepts apply to any sound. Let's use some drums. <laughs> 
So that's what they sound like when they're distorted symmetrically. For the asymmetric sound, I'm gonna use the plugin Decapitator. The T setting in Decapitator tries to emulate the sound of a triode tube, which are common in tube amps and give rise to lots of even harmonics. In fact, what a lot of people call the tube sound is really just asymmetry. And this is due to the fact that with tubes, you need to set a level where you say, this is the zero point on the wave. This level is called the bias. And if the bias isn't set in the middle of its operating range, which is how lots of tube amps are calibrated, you get asymmetric distortion. And lots of people like how this sounds on a guitar, but screw it, we're using it on drums. I got one more example. I have this Rhodes playing some chords. You can really hear the intermodulation distortion. You hear those nasty tones? But there's more than just symmetry to consider. We also have to think about the level of the sound we're sending into the saturator. This is controlled by the input gain or the drive. Now, why is drive important? As we saw earlier, sigmoid curves are roughly linear for low amplitudes and distort more for high amplitudes. And this means the amount of distortion is set by the level of the wave we're sending in. If our input gain is too small, the wave never goes into the nonlinear part of the curve and there's barely any change in the wave. If our input gain is too high, low levels of the wave contribute just as much to the distortion as high levels, and we can't control it well. So the symmetry is important, the input gain is important, but also the sharpness of the curve. The sharper the corners of your saturation curve, the higher the level of the added high frequencies will be. This is because increasing the sharpness of the curve makes the wave sharper. And since higher frequencies represent changes in the wave over shorter time spans, sharper corners must mean higher frequencies, which usually means harsher distortion. If this is confusing to you, I recommend you watch the first video of this series. It'll explain how all this stuff works. Softer curves ensure that the very high frequencies fall off quicker. Sharpening the corners even a little bit can make the wave sound much harsher, even though the shape of the wave doesn't change much, meaning that our perception of distortion isn't necessarily related to how distorted the waveform looks, or even how distortion is conventionally measured. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't use sharp curves. Sharp curves can add a lot of aggression, and the problem of harsh high frequencies can be addressed simply with an EQ after. There's one last thing I wanna talk about, which is distortion at low levels. Making a curve very steep near the zero point will make a sound more noisy. This is because very low X values on the graph correspond to low levels of the input wave. So making low X values have high Y values effectively makes the quiet parts loud and can bring up the noise floor. The noise floor becomes really apparent when you have an X value of zero with a non-zero Y value. On the flip side, if a sound is very noisy, you can kind of reduce that noise by making the curve go to zero around the origin, which can act as a sort of noise gate. But as we know, if it goes too sharply towards zero, it'll sound harsh. There's also the added problem we ran into earlier, where low levels deviate from a line and the wave distorts in an unnatural way. This is called crossover distortion, and it was a big problem in push-pull amplifiers found in early solid-state guitar amps that use transistors. These are the main things you have to think about when you're setting up your saturation curve, and having these things in the back of your mind will help you dial it in real quick and get that crunch you want. Anyway, let me know what topic I should talk about next. Thanks for watching.